Hello everyone, Dom here and in this video we're going to talk about a subject that comes up every now and then in the comments so I thought I'd make a video about this and this is the difference between bound selection, render in place and freeze and when you should use each in Cubase right after this. Cubase gives us many options when we want to render a piece of audio, when we want to bounce a piece of audio in place. And there are three main ways that you can do this, apart from audio mix down, of course. And this is bounce in place, render in place and freeze. And some people get confused on when they should use each one. What are the use cases? So in this video, I'm going to try and demystify this. I'm going to show you how I use each method and why it's better to use one method over the other, depending on the case. So let's start with a very obvious one and this is bounce in place. Now what is bounce in place? Bounce in place is basically a feature that has been in Cubase for quite a while, it's not new and it's basically a feature that exists in most DAWs to be honest with you. So first let me show you where you find bounce in place, you go to audio and then it's right here, bounce selection, okay, that's how it's called in Cubase. Now why would you want to use something like this? Let's say for example that I have these vocals here, these vocal chops, right, and let's say I want to turn them into a concrete audio file. This is one of the reasons why you would use bounce in place. It doesn't take into account any of the effects that you have. It takes into account any fade-ins, any fade-outs, any changes in volume like this. So all you need to do is select them, go to audio and then select bounce selection. In my case, I also have a shortcut Control alt b So when you do this, then Cubase is going to ask me if I want to replace the events. Let's hit replace. And now you can see that we have a concrete, continuous audio event that I can use very, very easily. It's very easy to handle. It's very easy rather than getting all these little pieces of audio and trying to move them around or edit them. So this is one of the reasons why you would use bounce selection or bounce in place. Now, another reason why you might want to use bounce selection is as you can see, for example, in this piece of audio, I have audio warp activated. So I'm actually stretching this audio in real time. Now, this can be quite intensive for some computers, right? In my case, it runs fine, I don't use the bounce selection, but sometimes you might find that when you have lots of vary audio events, sometimes when you have lots of time stretching, sometimes when you have lots of hit points activated, then you might find that your computer might become a little bit slow. So in this case, a very easy way to remedy this is to just select your audio bounce selection and then everything is basically bounced in a new file. So this doesn't take any CPU resources, it doesn't use any of the time stretching algorithms, it doesn't use the vary audio, it's basically a new audio file that you just created into your hard drive. Now what I tend to do when I do this is I always like to go here and create a duplicate version before I start doing all these things. Because when you do this, you can just create a new version and I can say, okay, I want to command alt B, bounce this selection, replace. But then if I want to say, go back to the original files, I can just go to the previous version. And as you can see, they're right there. So Cubase gives you a lot of options. Of course, all these files remain in your pool. So if you press control and P or command and P on the Mac, you will find the pool. And here you find all the files that you have in your project. So it's always a non-destructive process but I like to keep things neat and have a duplicate version right there just in case I want to go back really quickly. So like I said, this is very easy. Sometimes you might want to just get these files and perform this action very quickly so that you get a concrete file that's easier to manipulate, edit, move around and all these things because you might have done some really, really intricate edits and bounce selection is perfect for this. Now the next thing that we have in Cubase is the freeze. That was again something that was introduced quite a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago, I can't remember, but basically it was a life changer back then because CPUs were not fast enough and if you had like a very intensive VST instrument, for example, here I have my Apollo pad, okay, and 
my computer can handle this just fine. But let's say I had a very slow computer. It's very easy to just go here for this instrument and go right here, as you can see. Here you have the freeze channel button. In case you don't have this, for example, as you can see here on my audio channel, I don't have a freeze button. You can go here in your cogwheel. And if I go to my audio channels, okay, maybe I want to add the freeze to my visible controls. So I can add it there and you will see that now it will appear. It's right here. So if you don't have the freeze button, don't worry. It's very easy to set it up. If you want to set it up for your instrument channels, it's exactly the same way. And actually you can see quite a few things that you can unhide if you go into this track control settings window. Very, very useful and many people miss that. So that's a little tip. Now, if I want, for example, to freeze this Apollo pad, I can just go here and click on this freeze channel. And now I can choose to freeze just the instrument or also the effects. So let's say I have some reverb or some effects in this channel. This will freeze the effects as well. And I can also have some tail in case I have some nice reverb tails or delay tails, and then I can choose to unload the instrument when frozen. Now, I always tend to just freeze the instrument and unload the instrument when frozen in order to save some RAM. Now, this function compared to bounce in place is specifically created so that you save CPU resources and RAM resources. So basically, it's just a way of saying, OK, I'm happy with this right now. Click OK, and now I can just freeze this channel. And now this channel will still play. Let's solo it. But you will see that it has this lock icon right here, OK, this padlock. That means that I cannot move anything. I cannot do anything to this. I cannot edit the MIDI. There's nothing I can do. Now this is frozen. I don't have any control over this. And what I tend to do with cases like this is I temporarily freeze the channel so that I can conserve some resources, especially when I'm working with really massive orchestral libraries and they are very RAM intensive. So I just freeze them temporarily temporarily. And then when I want to go back and edit them again, I just unfreeze them like this. Because all these freeze files are just audio files that you store in the background. You can find them inside your project. I'm just going to unfreeze now. And now I'm back to normal. Now this I can edit again. I can edit the MIDI. And if I want to, I can refreeze again. So freeze in a nutshell is created just to conserve RAM and CPU. I think this is the best way to describe it. I don't think it's flexible for anything else. And I find myself using it less and less because now we have also render in place, which is the next thing that I'm going to show you. And render in place, in my opinion, is just amazing and magical. It allows you to do whatever you want very, very easily. Render in place can do many, many things. It has many applications, but let me show you a few of them, okay? Let's say, for example, that I'm very happy with this Apollo pad part and I want to commit to it in audio. In the old days, you used to have to go to File, Export, Audio Mix Down, select the channel, re-import it, or in later versions, you could import it as well. But nowadays, you have render in place. So let me show you how this works. I'm going to select these events. You have to select the events for render in place to work. And now I can go to edit, render in place, and I'm going to go to render settings, okay? So here's what happens. This is the dialogue that we get when we select to render this selection. Now, there are a few things that you can do. We can render dry, that means that in the audio file that we're going to get, we won't have the insert effects that we have applied to this channel. But the clever thing is that if we have applied some insert effects, these will be inserted into the audio channel that's going to be created, which is really, really cool. The next thing that we have is render the channel settings. That means that any effect that we have, any insert effects that we have in the channel, they're going to be rendered as well. Then we can render the complete signal path. That means that this is going to render also the group channel effects. So if, for example, the Apollo pad goes to a bus that has some EQ, this will also be rendered. If it goes to an effects channel that has a chorus or a delay, this is also going to be rendered. So it's very, very flexible. And this is a hugely powerful tool that we have in Cubase, many other DAWs, don't even come close to this. So this is a boom moment. Render in place is amazing. Then we have the complete signal path. 
and master effects, this means that we're also going to get the complete signal path, including the master bus, okay? So if we have some mastering plugins there, these are going to be bounced as well. Then we have some more properties like the tail mode. So you might want to have like some tail for reverbs to tail off. You can determine your tail size, the bit depth of your file. You can use a custom name if you want to, for example, maybe Apollo Pad. Otherwise, it's going to use the exact same names like with your events. And you can even choose a file location. So it's very easy to grab different events in your project and just render them into a specific folder in your hard drive. Now, there are quite a few options here you can save every single event as a separate file. You can have them as block events, especially if they're adjacent events, and you can have the file be one single event. So depending on what you're trying to do, I choose to go block events or separate events most of the times. So let's select these and I'm going to use my shortcut Shift W, which is render selection, and I'm going to go for dry in this case. And I can also mute the source events. Let's do this and let's see what happens. And boom, as you can see, now I have my Apollo pad right here. The original MIDI parts are muted, but they're still there. If I want to unmute them, I can still unmute them very, very easily. My shortcut for mute and unmute is V. And if you want to unmute them, you can go here and just mute them like this very, very easily. But now if you pay attention, if I hit the E button, you will see that I have my channel settings like the volume, the EQ, the filters, the insert effects are already there. So now I can still keep going with this track. I can start mixing it. I can start adding effects, but now it doesn't consume any CPU. But if we want to completely free our resources, what I tend to do is very, very simple. I go to my original one, and then what I do is I right click and disable the track, okay? Now this track doesn't consume any CPU or any RAM because it's disabled. And what I like to do after I do this, I tend to also hide it and it's gone. Now, if I want to bring it back, I can go back to visibility, bring it back and enable it. I actually have an entire macro to this because I do this thing all the time instead of freezing. I always go and when I'm almost happy with what I have, I just render it in place, especially when I know that I'm not gonna change the notes. I render it in place and then I keep mixing committed to audio. And then I still keep my MIDI, I disable the channel and then I hide it. So it's not in the way, right? So this is very, very neat, very clean. Now, another reason why you might want to use the render in place function is when you want to save some CPU cycles when you have loads of processing in a specific track. A very good example is vocals. You might have like uh, EQs, compressors, deessers, you might have like some tuning plugins, you might have reverbs, you might have delays. And it's very easy actually to go and say, okay, you know, I have this vocal here, it has all these effects. Instead of having trouble with all these plugins eating up all your CPU, what you can do is you can say, okay, I'm going to select my channel here and I'm going to render including the channel settings, sometimes maybe the entire signal path. And when you do this, basically Cubase renders everything for you and all the plugins, the EQs, the compressors, the effects are printed into the resulting audio file, which means that this is printed. I always tend to do this when I'm using, for example, analog gear, like uh, my EQs or my analog compressors or my black box or my SSL compressors, because I want to use them in more than one channels. And the best way to do this is rendering in place. Of course, when you have analog gear, the only difference is that you have to render in real time. Really not a big problem, especially when you want to use and reuse this lovely piece of analog gear that you might own. But even when you're using plugins, as you can see, now I have my channel here, this is my vocal, and you can see that it has zero effects on it. So now this eats up no resources due to plugins. If I go here now, of course, what I need to do, because this is still alive and these effects are also working, what I need to do is again, disable and hide this channel. And I'm gonna use my shortcut here and it's gone. I use this thing all the time. I can just bring this channel back and I can just enable it and unmute it. 
simple as that. And you see the point, I use rendering plays many times for sound designs. So I might have a boom and I have a hit and I want to have loads of reverb. Maybe I'm going to add the reverb momentarily to my channel and then I just render in place just this section and I have a new audio file that has just this portion of the audio that I want to maybe process it with a different effects chain. So render in place, in my opinion, is probably the most versatile way to do sound design, to save up with resources, RAM and CPU, and to also be very flexible when you want to create some really complex processing. And when you're using analog gear, for analog gear, it's a godsend. You know, you can't do anything without rendering in place. It would take ages if you had to export, re-import, export and re-import. This all happens automatically. You don't have to do any of the hard work. Cubase does everything for you. And I found that I'm using my analog gear more and more after rendering place was introduced in Cubase. So I'm very, very happy about this. So I hope this video demystified the three different ways to bounce your audio. So bounce selection, freeze and rendering place. In my opinion, rendering place is one of the killer features in Cubase. And if you're not using it, you should. So in the comments down below, let me know, did you know about all these methods and how do you use them? Because I'd really like to know, maybe there's something about bound selection that I haven't thought about. Let me know in the comments down below. Let's keep spreading the knowledge. Let's spread the Cubase love. If you enjoyed this video and if it helped you, you know what to do. And also share it if you know any Cubase user that would find it useful. Don't forget to find me on Instagram and all the other social media. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time, my friends. Bye!